Amen. 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 All the time? God is good. All right. You know, I just want to say uh, before we start, I'm just overwhelmed by by you guys and just how responsive you guys are, how loving you guys are, how gracious you guys are. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, it's definitely uh, been clear to me. So thank you. Um, can I pray one more time before we get into this? Thank you. God, thank you so much for being our great shepherd, our great leader. You've led us um, was, <laughs> wow, <laughs> I forgot what I was praying about. Um, <laughs> you've led us, Lord, um, and we just thank you so much. You've led us through the valley. You love, you've led us um, on mountaintops, and Lord, thank you so much for calling us and giving us this great privilege to now help lead other people um, as we continue to seek your leading. So, Lord, as we close SCL with one, one more session, at least this semester, Lord, May you continue to teach us. May you continue to uh, just change our hearts, change our perspectives. Uh, line it up with yours and line it up with your word. And so teach us now, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place that you would really speak into our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Ted Haggard, you guys might have heard his name before. He uh, started a church in, in the basement of his house with just a group of 22 people. They started doing Bible studies and meeting regularly, doing church together in his basement. And God blessed that, that fellowship and that ministry till it grew to 14,000 people. 14,000 people. One of the nation's largest mega churches. P- Ted Haggard, the pastor of this church, became a very influential Christian leader. He is a very well-known figure. Um, he also was the president and the leader of uh, the National Association of Evangelicals, huge organizations of over 40 different denominations and all the churches within their denominations. He was the voice, meeting with President Bush and the administration almost on a weekly basis to talk about politics and faith. He fought for biblical issues such as the sanctity of marriage. He, he fought hard for the church. Well, in 2006, he was accused, it came out, he was accused of visiting a male prostitute over the course of three years, soliciting sex um, or receiving um, services from him. And, and he was accused of purchasing methamphetamines and, and using that with him. And immediately, Ted Haggard fought. He fought back and he denied all those, all those charges against him. But a few days later, he had resigned from all his leadership positions uh, because many of those were true. That, that was Ted Haggard. And then there was a guy named Jim, Jimmy Baker. Some of you guys know him. Before televangelism had the bad reputation that, that it can have today, he was the face of televangelism. He had a huge uh, program called PTL, Praise the Lord, had millions of viewers, and he uh, had millions of people that he was reaching out to with the Word of God on a regular basis. He was bringing in millions of dollars for his ministry, and then it later came out that he was accused of having an affair with his secretary, which led to his resignation and, and his divorce, and then he was later charged with many accounts of fraud, which landed him a 45-year sentence in prison. And you hear these stories of these great Christian leaders, and yet they fell victim to their dark side. They fell victim to their dark side. And the thing is, it can happen to anybody. It can happen to any Christian leader. Theirs are just well-known because they're high-profile leaders. And so what, what happened to them when they fell, when they broke down, it was in the spotlight for everybody to know. But the fact is, it can happen to any of us. It happens to pastors, it happens to life group leaders, it happens to ministry leaders, it happens to volunteers, it happens to, to lay people. And it could have you know, varying degrees of, it, it, it could be a moral breakdown, it could be a psychological breakdown, a nervous breakdown, it could be moral failure, it could be uh, ex- just 
a, an explosion of emotion. It could be burnout. And it can happen to all of us. And so today, as, as we close SCL, this, this might be the most difficult session that we're going to have. Not so much because the material is so hard to grasp, but because we're going to be forced to realize this reality that we all have a dark side. And if it goes well, I pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to each one of us uh, the potential dark side that we, we have in ourselves individually. And hopefully the Holy Spirit will be speaking to us and bring some things to light so that we can uh, submit it to God and uh, not fall victim to our dark side. So w- what is the dark side? And so I-, I have notes for you guys. There's going to be a lot of fill in the blanks just to keep you guys um, awake and uh, following along. But, but uh, what is the dark side? It can be defined as, as this. It's defined as the inner urges, compulsions, and dysfunctions of our personality that often go unexamined or remain unknown until we experience some significant problem that causes us to break down. And I, and I want to say before we go on that everyone has a dark side. If you have a heartbeat, you have a dark side. If you have a sinful nature, you have a dark side. If you go outside and stand in the sun and you see your shadow, you have a dark side. If you don't see your shadow, you're a vampire. And that's an issue we're going to have to have in another session. But, but we all have a dark side, okay? And, and the thing is, we call it dark side because it's that thing that lurks in the shadows of our personalities, right? These, these factors are usually shadows of the very things that, that contribute to our success. So if any of us has potential, if we have great potential to be a leader, then you also have a potential lurking in the darkness to, to, to fall, and sometimes it's like the greater potential ha- you have, the greater potential you have to fall. And so, so we all have this dark side. The thing is, the, um, the manifestation of our dark side, it leaps on us sometimes unexpectedly. Like we, 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 we can commit immoral acts or there's an explosion of emotion, but the reality is it didn't really leap on us all of a sudden. It, the manifestation of our dark side may be an instance in time, but the development of it has been a lifetime in the making. So these things don't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen in an instance. It is actually a lifetime in the making. It's a long process. And sometimes it seems like it just happened out of nowhere. You know, I, uh, there was a, a pastor, and you, a lot of you guys know recently at New Hope, who... Um, was found to be having an affair. And when Pastor Wynn was sharing that with his congregation, and I was watching it online, he said something that, that really goes along with this truth. He said that when this pastor fell, and he was telling the congregation that he was going to have to go through a lot of counseling, and he said it was probably going to be at least three years of counseling. And he was saying what happened goes way beyond a, a sexual act. He says it was years in the making. It was years, it was a long period of time of an issue that was undealt with, it was overlooked. And so that's the truth about our dark side. We all have one, and it's been in the process of being developed. And so here, here's the paradox of the dark side. Here's the paradox of the dark side. The dark side in us, it can spawn good or bad, it can spawn joy or pain, potential or problems. It, it, it could actually bring about one or the other, good or bad. It's just when we use it selfishly, the dark side rises to the surface and we break down. However, it can be used to serve God's purpose in our lives rather than our own unmet needs. For example, I, I was talking about uh, Jimmy Baker, which it seems like a lot of you guys know about and you've heard about, but he shares in his own biography about how he grew up. And he had grown up, he says, in this small town in Michi- Michigan, and he remembers always being embarrassed about the house he lived in. It was a shabby house, and he was always embarrassed. He would have people drop him off a block away so that they wouldn't have to see where he lived, and then he would walk home. 
And then he said he was embarrassed about the lack of sophistication of the church that he attended. It, it was a rundown church. And he said that his pastor would paint the Sunday school rooms purple because purple paint was free. So he would paint it purple. And so he was embarrassed of the, of the church he went to. And he says in school, he wasn't all that of the typical male. He says he was a scrawny little guy. He only weighed 130 pounds in college, didn't have much stature, um, according to his peers. And even in school as a student, he was a poor student. He couldn't even graduate on time with the rest of his class. Then when he finally got into college, he couldn't even finish college. And so he's growing up with, this, with, with these issues of inferiority, right? He's growing up, and, and he says he ached to achieve and prove himself as capable. So all these things that he ex- experienced growing up were the very things actually that drove him to succeed, to be a successful Christian leader. And so as he went on in life, and as he discovered these opportunities before him, he became an impressive leader. He was driven to build quite an impressive kingdom, right? He, he built this huge Bible-themed uh, theme park that was actually the third largest in the nation. Um, he, he built lots of different properties and, and hotels, and he built up uh, one of the most popular Christian TV networks, PTL. But see, the very motivation that achieved, um, that, the very thing that motivated him to achieve the success also created in him uh, this self-deception and this weakness that brought about his failure. His struggle with self-worth made it easy for him to receive these bonuses that were extravagant in the six figures. His regretful memories of growing up in his childhood home and in his church, that kind of environment motivated him to manipulate funds um, that he received to to help finance, finance his lavish lifestyle. And all of a sudden, it came crashing down. It exposed him, and he, and he broke down. And then there's this other young guy. His name was Bill. And he said uh, when he was 18, he fell in love with this girl. He fell in love with this girl named Emily. He, he just wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. She was everything to him. And so he, he mustered up enough strength to propose to her. And she didn't get back to him right away. She really had to think about it. She thought about it a lot. And after a few months, excruciating months, she finally replies to him. She says, okay, I'll marry you. I'll marry you. And he's like, yes, I got her. Well, so as they're engaged, a few months go by, then she finally breaks the news to him. She says, I just can't do it. I, I can't marry you, Bill. And they, they said, all his friends and his family said that just absolutely crushed him, just broke him. And the reason that decided that she broke off the engagement was she said she wanted to marry somebody who was going to amount to something in life. And Bill just didn't seem like he was that guy. He wasn't going to really amount to anything. Well, that was a turning point for Bill. That, that really was a turning point. It inspired him to do something big with his life. And so Billy Graham made himself available to God, offering himself to the service of the Lord. He's now up to this point, I think he's preached to over 250 million people. He's preached the gospel to more people than anybody in history, more than Jesus Christ, more than the Apostle Paul. I would say he amounted to something big, right? But, but here's the thing. He realized he had a dark side. He realized that he had a sinful nature, just like every other person and every other minister. And so there's one crusade that they were at in Modesto, California, early on. And after he was experiencing this rise to fame, his name was becoming known all across the nation, all across the world, he got his team together. And he said, hey, let's let's separate. Let's, Let's talk to the Lord. Let's pray. And let's think about what are the great things that cause ministers to fall. And so they went apart and they prayed. They came back together and they came up with the Modesto Manifesto. And they decided, this is what they agreed on that day, that as a team, they would avoid every appearance of financial abuse. They would exercise extreme care to avoid even the appearance of any sexual impropriety, 
right? He didn't want, he wanted to be way above reproach. So from that point on, he made a point not to meet with any other female, not to ever eat alone with any other female alone except his wife. And so he made every effort not to let anybody put a finger on him. And they also decided as a team to be honest and reliable in their publicity and reporting of results. See, Billy Graham realized that, that he was vulnerable. He was capable to fall just like any other minister. And so the paradox of the dark side is it can, it can make us or it can break us. It could bring about joy or it could bring about pain. And so when we use it selfishly, we'll see that the dark side will rise and it will get us. It will get us. It will break us down. But if we use it for God's purposes and allow him to use it, he can use it for his kingdom. If we use it instead of, um, for God instead of our own unmet needs. So what I want to do now is I want us to look at some of the dark sides of leadership, some of the characteristics. So there's five personalities that I want to share with you guys tonight. I get it from this book called Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership. Um, is, this was a book that, that I read twice that our church, my previous church, we, we all read as leadership just because it exposed us to these very things. And then Gary McIntosh, who wrote it, actually was one of my professors in college. So, so I, I recommend this. It's not like the best book you'll ever read, but it's really informative. And I'm going to kind of give you a glimpse of what's in this book. And I hope it kind of whets your appetite to, to learn more about this, this truth about us so that we can be used for God's glory. So let's start off with this, the compulsive leader, the compulsive leader. And as I go through these personality types, these types of leaders, here, here's the thing. I want to really ask you guys to be careful not to think about the person next to you and <laughs> think about who this describes and who matches up to this, because we're all going to find ourselves doing that. We're going to be like, that's Pastor Gary. That's Pastor Gary for sure. <laughs> or you're going, to, you know, you're going to be thinking about your spouse or your brother or your sister. Don't do that. Okay, let's invite the Holy Spirit right now to teach us something about ourselves. Let's ask him to humble our hearts that we would be able to, to see and receive. Okay? So the compulsive leader. The compulsive leader kind of resembles the beaver personality. Okay? So... Not all beavers are compulsive, but they, they have this need to maintain absolute order. The compulsive leader has a compulsive personality and sees that the organization, he sees the organization as just another area of his life that must be controlled. Right? So it goes beyond just his personal life, um, but it, it, it seeps into his organizational life, his ministry, his work. The compulsive leader pursues perfection to an extreme, both in personal life and organizational life. They often develop this very rigid, this highly systemized daily routine that they have to follow meticulously, right? Whether it's exercise or their devotions or their schedule or their eating schedule or what they eat. They're very meticulous. They see the organization and the ministry as a direct reflection of his or her own person and performance. And that's kind of why they're so careful about this. That, that's why they're so compulsive. It's because what I do and how I lead and how my ministry goes or how my work goes directly reflects who I am. They, they have that, that idea that people will see who they are if they look at their organization. Okay? They also tend to be very status conscious. And as a result, they often go out of their way to impress their superiors or those who have authority over them. And compulsive leaders also tend to be workaholics. They tend to be workaholics. So on the inside, a lot of times we'll find that compulsive leaders are kind of like emotional powder kegs too. Right? They, they'll, they'll bottle up their anger because they believe it's wrong to express their true feelings. Um, so it's common for those who have repressed anger to express it suddenly and violently in outbursts, only to control it right away with, with quick apologies, right? They'll try to, try to make up for it right away. Here's what I want us to do. If you guys took a, uh, a packet like this, 
This is a quick little inventory. It's only 12 questions. And what I want you guys to do right now is take about three minutes to go down this list of about 12 questions. I want you to read the question and then mark the box that you feel best describes you. And when you mark it, instead of putting an X or a 1, put that number, okay? Because at the end, you're going to be adding them up. Um, first thing that comes to your mind, how you feel you actually are, go ahead and write that number in. And here's the thing. When I described the compulsive leader, some of those things kind of resonated with you. And you're like, yeah, that could be me. And then some things didn't. And so chances are you may or may not be a compulsive leader. But as I read it, some things totally didn't describe you at all. So that probably means you're not a compulsive leader. And as I read some of those descriptions, some of you guys were like, man, Greg's basically talking about me and not using my name. Chances are you are a compulsive leader. But this will help us give us a better idea. So take three minutes right now and then add it up when you're done and write it in in that line. Okay? Yeah. So if, if you feel like you agree with it, put a four. If your total, after you've added up all the numbers um, on your sheet, if your total is less than 20, then you're probably not compulsive. If your total is between 21 and 40, there's a likelihood that you have some compulsive tendencies. And if your total is 41 or more, you probably are a compulsive leader. Okay, so, so add it up and have an idea of whether or not you have compulsive tendencies. And then we're going to go through all five personality, uh, uh, personalities, and we're going to see which uh, tend to be your dark sides. Okay, so keep that in mind. Does anybody need more time? Okay, we'll take about um, 30 more seconds. <laughs> I kind of want to ask if we have any compulsive leaders here, but... <laughs> okay, how about this? As, as some people are finishing up, let me ask from you guys, what do you think a compulsive leader would look like in the church or in ministry? What are some examples of what that might look like? They're on top of everything, okay. Which, is that a good or a bad thing? It, it, it's, it's not necessarily bad, right? It's, it's not bad to pursue excellence, is it? It's not at all. But the striving for excellence that a compulsive leader, um, you know, often has, this, this pursuit of excellence can sometimes be obsessive perfectionism. And it could actually lead to his um, destruction. So, so we have to be uh, really uh, wary of that. What, what else might it look like? Yeah. Micromanager, micromanager yeah. He's going to micromanage everything. So if he has a team, a, uh, a leadership, a uh, ministry team, He's going to be telling people what they need to do, then he's going to go and make sure they do it, or he's going to do it for them, right? He's going to be a micromanager. This is all phrase years ago. The courier to go, behind the Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you actually uh, end up doing less than, than more. Right. Okay. Any other examples of what that might look like? Yeah. A nervous breakdown? Looking for a place to happen? Not somebody who wants a lot of otters. Oh, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Definitely don't want otters around them. Okay, yeah. And that's, that's going to happen. Some of you guys are going to be uh, leaders who tend to be compulsive, and you're going to have otters. And so we need to um, not only just learn to work with them, but we have to learn to manage our uh, compulsive tendencies. Let's go on to the narcissistic leader. The narcissistic leader. In, in Greek mythology, there's this guy named Narcissus who was renowned for his beauty. People loved him because he was so beautiful. People would say that his face looked like it was chiseled out of pure marble. Has anyone ever said that to you? <laughs> Last time someone said that to me, it felt so good. <laughs> but yeah, he was beautiful, and he was drawn to this pool. He came across this pool, and he sees this reflection, and he, he becomes immediately 
transfixed on this image. He loves it. He just falls in love, not realizing at first that it's himself. And he comes to a point where he eventually can't leave because it's so beautiful. So he just spends all his time right there staring at his own image to the point where he dies and he gets absorbed by the earth and out sprouted a flower, which is where we get the narcissist flower that's you know, found near, near uh, ponds. But narcissism is the kind of leader where the world revolves on the axis of self. The world revolves on the axis of self. So people and issues orbit them as they, caught, they get caught in this strong gravitational pull to the narcissist's um, self-absorption. So everything's about the self. The narcissistic leader may be chronically uncertain of himself and experiences dissatisfaction with his uh, accomplishments. So he's always thinking about himself and he's never satisfied because he wants to be better. He wants people to love him more. The narcissistic leader also has an overinflated sense of their own importance to the organization or to the ministry. And they have this exhibitionistic need for constant attention and admiration from others, especially those they lead and any person or group to whom they report. So they always want to be admired. They always want attention. And let, let, let me just say this. As I'm describing these types of leaders, um, these are just the extremes, okay? So this might not always perfectly uh, describe your tendencies, but there might be hints of that um, in your life. So narcissistic leaders, they uh, have this great drive to achieve greatness, but the, this restless ambition is rarely satisfied, so they're not really to enjoy their accomplishments. They also feel threatened by anyone else's accomplishments or abilities because they may risk losing the exclusive admiration of their followers. So they're so in love with themselves and what they do that anytime someone else does something well or accomplishes something or succeeds, they, they hate it. They feel threatened because everybody who loves me may start loving them. They may tend to exploit others in order to indulge in self-promotion. So sometimes narcissistic leaders will take advantage of people, use people, in order to build themselves up. And so it's kind of weird. It seems like for a spiritual leader, this is the exact opposite of what you should be. But the problem is, this actually describes many church leaders today. Many church leaders find themselves um, dealing with this issue of narcissism. So let's, let's go ahead and turn to that narcissistic leader uh, inventory. Take about three minutes and just be honest with yourself as you answer these questions. Add it up and then circle your number. In the church, a narcissistic leader, what might it look like um, if a narcissistic leader is leading a ministry? They what? They have a fear of letting others down. Why, why would that be? Okay, because, yeah. Yeah, they can never fail. They, that, that, there's that great pressure upon themselves. Good. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. So there, there might be a lot of drama involved with it. Good. Yeah. Uh, always boasting of their accomplishments. Always boasting, always talking about themselves and how well they did. Yeah. People will be stressed out by the narcissistic leader because they always talk about themselves or they always want to. Okay. Yeah. True of the compulsive leader, probably true of the narcissistic leader. Um, it also, if somebody performs something, if a leader preaches a sermon or maybe uh, speaks to his group, um, 
immediately when they step off that platform, there's these thoughts of, of how did I do? What do people think of me? And they get consumed with, with themselves. And that, that actually happens to a lot of people who are going to come up and talk to, to a crowd of people. So I think that's, that's almost normal, but, but the narcissistic leader tends to obsess over it. How did I do? How, how was my performance? Um, also, you know, a lot of times uh, ministry leaders who are narcissistic, um, they'll, they'll lead groups. The, 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 like Claire was saying, they'll go 100 miles per hour taking on all these projects and all these things because it makes them look good. It, it uh, creates a good image for them. And so they bring all these people along and people are getting burnt out. And it, that's an example of how sometimes they'll use people and exploit people for their own self-promotion. Right? Um, so they'll find themselves creating new mis- ministries, beginning new ministries, even though everybody else is suffering. And so they thrive off this acclamation, right? people's applause. Okay. Let's go on to the next type of dark side, the paranoid leader. The paranoid leader. Anybody can think of a paranoid leader in the Bible? King Saul, right? King Saul, he, he, he was actually a very capable man. He was the first king over the uh, kingdom of Israel. Very tall, handsome, good-looking, attractive. Um, and God called him to use him. God wanted to use him. And one thing that God wanted him to do was to, to defeat the Philistines. To defeat the Philistines. But along comes this little kid, this little boy named what? David who takes out their champion, Goliath, takes out you know, their champion, and all of a sudden, he sends the Philistines off running. And one day, the ladies are crying out. What do they cry out? Saul has slayed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands, and they're just praising him for all these. And all of a sudden, what grips Saul's heart? Jealousy. Just jealousy. And all of a sudden, his, his, his mission and his pursuit all of a sudden became to kill David. i got to kill David. Why? Because he might take my throne. He might take my position. And all of a sudden, that's what uh, he was about until it led to his death. He got so caught up in it, he got um, to a point where he had to take his own life in battle. That's, that's an example of the paranoid leader. The paranoid leader, they're desperate Desperately afraid of anything or anyone who they perceive have even the remotest potential of undermining their leadership and taking their position, just like Saul. They're characteristically suspicious, hostile, and guarded in their relationships with others. They're very paranoid. Well, why are you saying what you're saying? Why are you getting close to me? What are, what are you trying to do here? which means they can also be hypersensitive to the actions and reactions of those they lead. Some might say they're afraid of their own shadow. They're afraid of their own shadow. The people, the very people they're trying to lead and bring up and pass the baton to, sometimes those are the people that they're most paranoid of because that person might become greater than me and win greater fame or acclaim than than I do. So they're jealous of other leaders or of those they lead. The, the paranoid leader may want to scheme and spy to maintain a firm grip on his leadership or her leadership. They may want to build secret alliances and networks with those who can be easily manipulated by this particular leader. So looking at our history, who would be a, a prime example of a paranoid leader? President Nixon, right, who anyone he perceived to be his opponent or his, you know, his enemy or a threat to him um, made him nervous. And so he would come up with plans and schemes to, to make sure that, you know, he wasn't going to be threatened or his position wasn't going to be threatened. The paranoid leader may overreact to even the mildest form of criticism. They perceive it as an effort to overthrow them or diminish their power, even if someone's just trying to constructively criticize them. And in ministry, we need constructive criticism. We need people to be honest with us and sharpen us. But this type of leader will tend to take that um, as, as 
this person trying to overthrow me or undermine my leadership. So let's, let's uh, turn to the paranoid leader inventory. Let's take a few minutes to fill that, fill that out. Leader might look like in ministry. Very insecure. Is there like a particular example or setting that, that might come out in? Yeah, yeah, kind of like one of those, like if you see people talking and you're wondering, are they talking about me and what are they talking about and I got to find out. Okay, good, yeah, paranoid leaders. Let's go on to the uh, next one, which is the passive aggressive leader. The passive aggressive leader. There's a couple ways that people understand this. Um, One way is... Passive aggressiveness is, is when you manifest your aggression in nonverbal, negative, or passive ways. It's like when you're angry at someone or something, and instead of expressing it out loud and being verbal about it, you express it by doing nothing, or you express it in reluctance. So you kind of withdraw. Um, some people say passive aggressiveness is expressed as learned helplessness. Learned helplessness where one has kind of learned to be helpless because he's found it useless to be proactive. Why should I do that? Or why should I take initiative? I'm just going to get shot down or, you know, it's, it's, it's going to amount to nothing. And so they learn to be helpless. Reluctance sometimes, though, in pa- passive aggressiveness stems from fear of failure. It could be because they're afraid to fail, and if they take on a project, they might um, succeed, but that's only going to bring on greater expectations of me, and so that's just going to set the stage for greater failure in the future. So they might have this fear of failure that makes them um, not perform. And so they have a tendency to resist demands in their workplace or in their ministry, um, demands to adequately perform, and it can be expressed through procrastination, Stubbornness, forgetfulness, intentional inefficiency. So they, they kind of have this impulsive behavior, right? They display impulsive behavior. They're prone to these short outbursts of emotions, such as anger or frustration or even sadness, because they're bottling it all up inside her. Right? They're angry, Some, someone made them mad, or someone shot them down, or someone shut them up, and so they don't say anything, they bottle it up, they keep quiet, and all of a sudden, it might explode one day. So sometimes their colleagues or the people they work with in ministry, they feel edgy as they're waiting for that next outburst. They don't know when it's going to come, because they've seen it before. You know, most days he's happy and nice and easygoing, but then, but then it can come any moment. So... They also tend to exhibit impatience, irritability, and fidgeting when things don't go their way. So they could be sitting in a meeting and, and people are saying stuff or discussing plans and they're angry, but they're not going to say anything about it, but you can see in their body language, you can, you can read that they're not very happy. So let's turn to that uh, passive-aggressive inventory. I have about th- three minutes to do that. I know I'm going a little bit fast, but we have still some other things to talk about before we close. Codependent leader. This is the final leadership type we'll be talking about tonight. And, and, uh, and obviously, these aren't all the different types of dark sides that are found in people. Um, but it's the last one we'll be talking about tonight, quite common one. And the codependent leader is kind of hard to define because it's more of a generic trait um, that can actually be found in different personality types, maybe even some of the ones we've just talked about. Um, But this is how we define it. In a strict sense, in a very strict sense, codependency is defined as a psychological condition or relationship in which a person is controlled or manipulated by another who is affected 
with a pathological condition or some kind of maybe addiction or substance um, dependency. So, for example, what that means is like, you know, it's often associated with people who grow up living with another person or um, other people who are compulsively dependent on, let's say, alcohol or drugs, um, some kind of addiction. And so they depend on this. And in that environment, there's kind of these, these rules that are put on them, right? They've learned what they can say, what they can't say. Um, as a codependent, I've learned what I can do or what I can't do around this person because I know what's going to get me in trouble. So what happens is they start learning to just keep it to themselves, to, to keep this peace. Because I'm like walking on eggshells. I don't want to uh, disturb the peace. I don't want to anger this person because it'll, I'll have consequences. So, um, so they become codependent. So in a, in a general sense... It's a personality and behavior that develops as a result of one's prolonged exposure to a set of oppressive rules, spoken or unspoken, that prevent the person from being able to express feelings or internal issues. So in essence, what it is, is it's the problem of codependency involves the ways that um, we cope with other people's behavior and the expectations of those around him or her. How that person behaves or what they expect of me controls what I say and what I do. It often involves placing a lower priority on one's own needs while being excessively preoccupied with the needs of others. So I'm more concerned about you and taking care of you, making sure you're happy and satisfied and pleased, even if it affects me, even if it hurts me. So one, one tendency of codependent leaders or, or people is that they tend to react rather than initiate action. They react to the behavior of the other person, the stronger person, the dependent person. So they may react by trying to cover up problems, sugarcoat, just so that they can maintain peace in their relationships. Some of you guys are really resonating with this, right? You'll go lengths. The codependent leader will go lengths to avoid hurting a person's feelings, even if it hurts themselves. So they'll take the responsibility of others. Um, when somebody's behaving inappropriately, they'll, they'll, they'll take the blame. They feel like they're the ones to blame as a codependent person. Obsessively worry about the feelings of others, often to the point of emotional illness or physical illness. They often re- repress anger and frustration because they do not feel it's, um, it's safe to speak out. It should be, that not shouldn't be there. Because they do not feel it is safe to speak out. So let, let's take a couple minutes just to fill out this last inventory. And then when you're done with that, we're going to look at some ways we can overcome the dark side, okay? And again, if your total on any of the tests is less than 20, you're probably not that personality um, type or leadership type. If your total is between 21 and 40 on any of them, there is a likelihood that you have some of those tendencies, and 41 or more, that probably is your dark side that you need to be aware of. And so... In just about the few minutes that we have left, um, I want to talk about how do, how do we overcome the dark side, right? And here's the thing. I, I don't know if we can really ever get rid of our dark side, if we can ever eradicate our dark side. It's always with us. It's kind of like that shadow that periodically disappears and then reappears later. But if we are aware of it, and we deal with it, and we give it to God, I believe we can subdue it, and according to uh, Mr. McIntosh, we can overcome it for longer periods of times, um, and increasingly longer periods of time, even though we can't totally get rid of it. And that happens, like we said before, when our dark side is 
Well, actually, not only can we overcome it, but, but God can actually use it. And he does use people's dark side to help accomplish his purposes and his work. And that happens when we use it not for our own selfish needs, right, to uh, um, meet our own unmet needs, but we give it to God to use for his purposes. So here, here's a few ways I want to share with you guys. And keep in mind, um, it's, it's not simple. Sometimes it's actually a very a long process. Sometimes it requires professional help. Sometimes it requires seeing a counselor. So, but let me just give you a few things to keep in mind. Number one, acknowledge your dark side. Right? We've been saying that all night. Admit that it exists and understand the shape that it's take, taken in your life. And when you acknowledge it, don't blame others. Don't blame others um, when it manifests. Realize that it's been developing. And in acknowledging it, we also have to receive God's power over it. Realize that God, His grace is sufficient for us. Right? In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, Jesus says, He says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. When you're weak, then I am strong. When you struggle, I, I, I'm glorified because you see um, how victorious I am. Okay, so second, we need to examine the past. And this is when we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us truth about ourselves when we seriously reflect upon the past. And so it's true, I think, it's, it's accepted that our past undoubtedly impacts our present. Who we are today is a product of our past, our past experiences, the events, the emotions that we felt. We are the sum product of that. So take some time to look at your childhood experiences. And it's not always an easy thing, but some things you want to look for are areas of pain, sorrow, rage. Look at those experiences that have had an impact on you one way or the other. And, and these, these, these events or these memories don't always have to be serious things like abuses, physical or verbal abuse. They may be, but they can be relatively harmless experiences that have impacted you, um, things that you still remember. Like, for example, um, I, I saw a counselor for about, a, for about two years, and one thing that, that came up in my counseling sessions was that a lot of times I'm disconnected um, emotionally, even with myself. And, you know, one thing we realized that growing up was my mom and my dad never created a, an environment where I could really share with them. Like when I came home from school, and I, they never really asked, how was my day? What did you learn? How are you feeling? And so I never really grew up with that. And that's not dramatic. It wasn't a painful experience. I didn't even really think about it until I talked with my counselor. But I realized I've never grown accustomed to sharing my feelings with people. I've never grown accustomed to processing my feelings. And so certain things like that will be helpful for us to know. And also in acknowledging our past, we should also deal with the past, which mean, may mean um, that you need to express your feelings, things you come across with a parent or a friend from your childhood. And this isn't you know, an opportunity for you to blame them, it's not for you to say, why did you do this or why didn't you do that? But it's a way to take personal responsibility for this element of your dark side in a very concrete way. A lot of times when we express our feelings, you, you take the power away that the dark side has on us. If you're able to, to come to grips with it and acknowledge it. So remember, again, I, I need to emphasize, it's not to assign blame, but to, 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 to gain self-understanding. And, you know, when I was talking with my counselor, a lot of things came up from my childhood, a lot of things about my parents, what they did or didn't do. And she would always say to me, it's, you know, it, this isn't a time to, to make your parents look bad or to get angry at your parents. It's just coming to grips with reality and how you were brought up. Okay, so that's important to understand. And sometimes dealing with the past um, means that we're going to have to extend forgiveness, whether it's to a person in your past, to extend forgiveness to some form. But sometimes this includes uh, forgiving yourself. 
You know, the Bible makes it clear that one of the greatest ways that Satan um, binds us is through unforgiveness. It's probably one of the greatest methods he uses is, is um, unforgiveness. That's, that's how he tries to get into our lives and into our relationships. When we, when we don't forgive, it's like an open invitation to Satan um, to, to bind us and place this bondage upon us. Okay, number three. Resist the poison of expectations. Resist the poison of expectations. Expectations are kind of like a two-edged sword, right? They can be the things that propel us and motivate us and drive us, but they can also be the things that weigh us down and bring about our failure. A lot of times, expectations are placed on us by others or even by ourselves, and it's that driving force behind our achievement it is, inspires us to succeed, but they can be also very destructive when they're unrealistic. They can produce friction, pressure within us that's going to lead to burnout or an explosion of emotion. So, so this is the thing. Expectation is not bad, but we've got to be careful to weigh it, right, to... To resist the kind of expectations that are poisonous, those are the ones that are unbiblical or extra-biblical, unrealistic or legalistic. And so after we're able to identify those sources of unhealthy expectations, here, here's what's really important. We need to apply the oil of God's grace to our life and our leadership. We've got to remember that you know, Jesus said, my, my yoke um, is not heavy, but it's light. I didn't come to put legalistic expectations on you, but I've come to, to give you grace. So it's not by anything we do. Um, it's not by what laws we're able to keep, but it's by his grace. And so his burden is light. Practice progressive self-knowledge. That's the fourth way we can start dealing with our dark side. And that's engaging in spiritual disciplines. Because when we engage in spiritual disciplines, we allow the Holy Spirit to really scrutinize us and look into our lives. And so a couple of things we can do. Scripture reading. Remember in the book of James, if you've read it, it says that the Scripture, the law, is like a mirror where we can look into and it exposes God's standards, His truth, and it also exposes um, things about us. So we need to look into Scripture. But besides that, take personal retreats. As a seminary student, this was mandatory. We had to take time away just to get away, arrange to get away from our families, our ministry responsibilities, our kids. Even if it's a one-day retreat, just to, to reflect, what's my spiritual condition like? What have I been neglecting in my life? What's the condition of the most important relationships in my life? How have I been managing my time? So we need to consider those things. Journaling. Take a journal on those retreats. Take a journal during your quiet times and start writing down things about your life. It's going to be a clarifying process, right? Who am I? What am I doing and why am I doing it? How do I feel about my life? How do I feel about my world? In what ways am I growing? In what ways am I not growing? Okay, so journal. And finally, I want to just say this. Understand your identity in Christ. That's probably one of the most important things um, in overcoming our dark side. It's, it's realizing who we are now that we've been saved by grace. right? Because every time you look into your life, anytime you do any kind of serious introspection, it's, it's depressing. It could be very frustrating. It can make you angry. Because when you look into your life, you're going to realize how depraved you are, how sinful you are, how dark it is sometimes. But we have to understand our position versus our condition. Right? Because our condition is we are wasting away physically. We're dying. We are sinful. We have a sinful nature. But if we realize our position, we realize we're in Christ. We have eternal life. We've been saved by grace. My citizenship is in heaven not based on what I do or what I don't do. I am a child of God. John 1, 12 says, to those who believe, to those who have received him, he's given the right to be called children of God. And so we have to understand 
our identity. And so I know that was like a ton of information. And I, so I just want to direct you again to this resource, Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership. It's a lot more in-depth. Um, I just gave you um, a few drops of it. But this is a book you might want to check out. And so I encourage you, as we close, really consider the results of those inventories. Um, take note of those things that scored high. And let's start giving it to God and acknowledging it before Him and allowing Him to work in our lives so that we don't break down. Okay. Let me pray, then I'm going to ask Pastor Gary to come up to close SEL. Father God, we thank you so much again for the privilege to serve you and to serve your people. Thank you so much that you've given us all very unique um, gifts, unique personalities, unique leadership styles. And Lord, we, we acknowledge and we know that because of sin, because of our sinful nature, that there's things about us that, that lurk um, in the shadows of our personalities. And and it can destroy us, and not just us, but the ministries that we serve in. So, Lord, let us be vigilant people, Lord. Help us to be aware. Help us to do the things we ought to do so that you can look into our lives and reveal things about ourselves to us so that we can submit them to you and turn them over to you and allow you to do your powerful, victorious work in our lives. So, God... As we close, Lord, we thank you so much um, that you would call us your sons and daughters. Thank you so much for Jesus, that you loved us so intensely, so deeply, that you would come from heaven to earth to die for us, the greatest gift. Thank you so much, God. We praise you and we honor you. We want to live to let your light shine in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.